It is my pleasure to welcome you to this in-depth lecture, the fourth part of the 7th ESRA Congress International Edition, where we will delve into the anatomy and sonography of the cervical spine. The first cervical spinal nerve, C1, exits the spinal canal above the C1 vertebra atlas, specifically between the occipital bone and the first cervical vertebra. This superior exit pattern continues through the cervical spine, such that the C7 spinal nerve emerges between the C6 and C7 vertebrae. However, the eighth cervical spinal nerve, C8, emerges between the C7 vertebra and the first thoracic vertebra, T1, despite the absence of a corresponding C8 vertebra. From the thoracic level downward, spinal nerves exit below their respective vertebrae, following the standard segmental arrangement. This anatomical configuration holds important clinical implications as it underpins the organization of cervical dermatomes and myotomes and is essential for accurate neurological localization in the context of radiculopathy, spinal trauma, and image-guided interventions such as selective nerve root blocks or regional anesthesia techniques. The C1 vertebra, atlas, lacks both a vertebral body and a spinous process. Its structure consists primarily of two lateral masses connected by anterior and posterior arches, forming a bony ring. This configuration allows for cranial flexion and extension movements such as nodding yes, it articulates superiorly with the occipital condyles and inferiorly with the axis, C2. The C2 vertebra, axis, is specialized for head rotation. Its most distinctive feature is the odontoid process, dens, a vertical projection arising from the vertebral body. This structure acts as a pivot around which the atlas rotates, enabling the head to turn side to side as in the motion of shaking no. Unlike the atlas, the axis has a well-defined vertebral body and spinous process and is stabilized at its articulation with C1 by strong ligaments that secure the dens. Cervical vertebrae C3 to C6 are classified as typical cervical vertebrae as they exhibit the conventional anatomical features characteristic of the cervical region. These include a small rectangular shaped vertebral body with a slightly biconcave superior surface. On each side of the vertebral body are the unsenate processes, uncus, elevated lateral ridges that help define the vertebral groove and contribute to the formation of the uncovertebral joints of Lushka, structures unique to the mid cervical spine. The vertebral foramen in these vertebrae is broad and triangular, adapted to accommodate the cervical segment of the spinal cord. Each vertebrae possesses transverse processes that are perforated by transverse foramina, through which pass the vertebral artery, vertebral vein, and the periarterial sympathetic plexus, except C7, which typically does not transmit the vertebral artery. The spinous processes of these vertebrae are usually bifid, increasing the surface area available for muscle and ligament attachment. These vertebrae are structurally adapted to provide precise and controlled neck mobility, enabling flexion, extension, lateral bending, and rotation of the head and cervical spine, while simultaneously offering protection to critical neurological and vascular structures. The C7 vertebra, referred to as the vertebra prominence, more closely resembles a thoracic vertebra in size and form. It is characterized by a long prominent and typically non-bifid spinous process, making it easily palpable at the base of the neck and a reliable surface anatomical landmark. Unlike the other cervical vertebrae, the transverse foramen of C7 is usually smaller and typically does not transmit the vertebral artery, which generally enters the cervical spine at the level of C6. These structural differences reflect the functional adaptations of each vertebra, C1 for cranial support, C2 for axial rotation, and C7 as a transitional segment between the cervical and thoracic spine, providing enhanced structural stability. The vertebral artery originates from the subclavian artery and, as seen before, ascends through the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae, typically beginning at C6 and continuing upward through C5 to C1. After exiting the transverse foramen of C1 atlas, it curves medially and posteriorly, crossing the posterior arch of the atlas in the suboccipital triangle. It then pierces the atlanto-occipital membrane and dura mater, entering the cranial cavity through the foramen magnum.
The cervical region offers anatomical and accessibility advantages that allow imaging in all three planes, axial, sagittal, and coronal. This is due to the shallower depth of neural structures, reduced bony interference, particularly between spinous and transverse processes and the mobility of the neck, which enables lateral positioning of the transducer. These factors create suitable acoustic windows, including for the coronal plane, facilitating a more comprehensive assessment of the spinal canal, spinal cord, and nerve roots. Furthermore, the cervical region's superficial anatomy typically allows for the use of a high-frequency linear transducer, which provides excellent spatial resolution for visualizing fine neural and musculoskeletal structures. However, in patients with increased body mass or poor acoustic windows, a low-frequency convex curvilinear transducer may be considered to improve penetration, albeit at the cost of reduced image resolution. For the acquisition of axial plane images, the transducer is positioned in a lateral axial orientation placed over the midpoint of the neck, which typically corresponds to the C4 to C5 vertebral level. This anatomical location serves as the recommended starting point for any ultrasound scanning. At this level, the anterior pillar is visualized, formed by the transverse processes and the nerve roots corresponding to each spinal level. The articular pillar is identified in the most lateral aspect, while the posterior vertebral arch is delineated by the lemony and spinous processes. To evaluate the cervical nerve roots and the sympathetic chain, an anterior axial scanning approach is employed. For the identification of the zygapophysial facet, joints and medial branches, a lateral axial or coronal scanning plane is used. Lastly, for the assessment of the neuraxis, specifically the epidural space, the preferred approach is a paramedian oblique sagittal plane. The transverse process is seen anteriorly as a hyperechoic bright structure with posterior acoustic shadowing. It may show one or two prominences corresponding to the anterior and posterior tubercles, depending on the cervical level. The articular pillar, zygapophysial joint, can be identified as a rounded hypoechoic structure with posterior shadowing in the central part of the image. It represents the union of the vertebral laminae and their joint. Laminae appears as hyperechoic lines extending from the articular pillar toward the transverse process, forming the roof of the vertebral canal. The spinous processes are the posterior continuation of each lamina, ending in two bony prominences that correspond to the posterior tubercles. We will begin with the anterior axial scanning patterns commonly encountered at the cervical level. After identifying the articular pillar in the axial scanning plane, the transducer is advanced anteriorly to obtain an anterior axial view of the transverse processes. It is important to note that this plane allows for the evaluation of the cervical nerve roots emerging above each transverse process, as well as the cervical sympathetic chain, situated typically at the level of C6 or C7. To accurately identify each of the nerve roots forming the brachial plexus, orientation is guided by the acoustic shadows cast by the transverse processes at each cervical level. The corresponding nerve root appears as a round to oval hypoechoic structure located between these bony landmarks. The roots can then be located using the traceback method. Identifying the cervical level with ultrasound is based on the difference between C6 and C7 transverse process anatomy. The C7 transverse process is identified by the small OR absence of anterior tubercle on ultrasound, and it can be compared to C6, C5, and C4 by sliding the transducer between adjacent vertebrae. The transverse processes of these vertebrae are characterized by the presence of two distinct tubercles, an anterior tubercle and a posterior tubercle. The brachial plexus appears on ultrasound as a cluster of small hypoechoic nodular structures located within the interscaline groove. Cervical level differentiation during ultrasound examination relies on the distinct anatomical features of the transverse processes of C6 and C7. The transverse process of C7 is identified by its small or absent anterior tubercle, whereas the transverse processes of C6, C5 and C4 are characterized by well-defined anterior and posterior tubercles, which are readily identifiable sonographically. The lateral axial scanning plane is useful for identifying the cervical facet 
zygapophyseal joints, as well as the medial branch that innervates each corresponding level. Initiating the examination over the articular pillar will allow us to identify the cervical facet joint line or a section of the articular pillar, either the adjacent superior or inferior articular process. At this point, we will rotate the transducer to obtain a coronal scanning plane, a longitudinal lateral view of the articular pillars. The coronal scanning plane is the one that divides the body into anterior and posterior sections. In the cervical region, this plane is positioned over the articular pillar. The resulting image evokes a landscape of mountains and valleys. In this analogy, the mountains correspond to the prominent acoustic shadows produced by the facet joints, while the valleys represent the regions of the articular pillar traversed by the medial branches, which are responsible for providing sensory innovation to each joint. In the following real-time video, our observation will commence with an examination along the axial axis. During this phase, we will identify the articular column and the posterior tubercle of its transverse process. Subsequently, as we rotate the transducer to embark on a coronal exploration, we will be presented with an image of the cervical articular pilar, characterized by its undulating montanes and valleys. The sagittal scanning axis allows for the evaluation of the neuroaxis along its longitudinal course. Starting from the lateral axial scanning axis, the transducer is moved posteriorly, allowing clear visualization of the vertebral lamina and spinous process. From this posterior axial scanning point, the transducer is moved in a caudal direction until the acoustic shadow cast by the vertebral lamina disappears. This enables visualization of the contents of the vertebral canal, including the dura mater, cerebrospinal fluid, and the spinal cord in its short axis. At this point, the transducer is rotated to align with the interlaminar sagittal axis. In an oblique paramedial sagittal scanning axis, consecutive hyperechoic images can be observed in a sawtooth-like pattern. This configuration enables visualization of the posterior complex through the acoustic window between each of these structures. Here we can observe the real-time exploration dynamics. Once the articular pillar, lamina, and spinous process are identified in the axial plane, we will slide the transducer caudally to visualize the interlaminar space and the spinal cord. At this point, we will rotate the transducer to an oblique paramedian sagittal axis where we can observe the posterior and anterior complexes between each lamina.